The sun did not shine, it was too wet to play, so we sat in the house all that cold, cold, wet day. I sat there with Sally, we sat there we too, and I said how I wish we had something to do. In only 236 words, Theodore Seuss Giesel revolutionized the way children read. His legacy of colorful illustrations and fast-paced rhymes convinced children that reading was fun. Four generations of children have been gently led into a love of reading and have been quietly taught social values. The legacy of Dr. Seuss books can be seen in the writing styles of modern children's authors. Theodore Giesel's childhood in Springfield, Massachusetts surrounded him with landmarks and people who influenced his personality and later his books. His mother, a former baker, sang rhymes she used to memorize pie recipes to entertain young Ted. Dr. Seuss said, more than anyone else, my mother is responsible for the rhymes I write. As a child, his parents took him to the Springfield Zoo every Sunday. After seeing the animals, Giesel's imagination ran wild and he drew exaggerated cartoon versions of them. He said, I was trying to do real animals, but I'd put too many knuckles on them. Ted's writing career began at Springfield Central High School when he entertained with his poetry in the school newspaper, Central Recorder. He attended school at Dartmouth College where he first began his path to self-described marrying words to pictures. I began to get it through my skull that words and pictures were yin and yang. I began thinking that words and pictures married might possibly produce a progeny more interesting than either parent. Easel edited Dartmouth's humor magazine, Jack o' Lantern. He successfully entertained the students at Dartmouth until a party abruptly ended his career. Ted said, the night before Easter of my senior year, there were 10 of us gathered in my room at the Randall Club. We had a pint of gin for 10 people. The disciplinary action imposed by Dean Laycock that the editor-in-chief of Jack o' Lantern was relieved forthwith of his official responsibility for running the magazine. Theodore continued to contribute to the magazine after being removed from the staff, entering all of his works under the pseudonym Seuss. To what extent this corny subterfuge fooled the dean, I never found out, but that's how Seuss came to be as my signature. The doctor was added later on. Following graduation from Dartmouth, Ted enrolled at Oxford University, planning to become an English professor. He quickly realized it was a path he was not meant to follow. While struggling through a lecture by cartooning rather than taking notes, a classmate, Helen Palmer, looked over his shoulder. She was a gal who was sitting next to me when I was doing this notebook, and she was the one who said, You're not very interested in the lectures. I think that's a very good flying cow. It was she who finally convinced me that a flying cow was a better future than tracing long and short E through Anglo-Saxon. He then dropped out of school, but married Helen, who became his lifelong collaborator. While Helen supported the couple by teaching, Giesel submitted cartoons to various publications. Eventually, he landed a job in 1927 creating full-color cartoons at Judge Magazine, where his first cover proved he could sell magazines. I'd drawn them by the millions, newspaper ads, booklets, window displays, 24-sheet posters. He later signed a contract with Standard Oil and used his talents to lead others to purchase products. With his humor, he could sell anything. He had a way with words and pictures that established Seuss as a leader in marketing products. Limited by his Standard Oil contract, Seuss turned to writing children's books. He said, I would like to say I went into children's book work because of my great understanding of children. I went in because it wasn't excluded by my Standard Oil contract. While Dr. Seuss was on a boat ride home, a storm began above deck. He was right next to the engine, and the loud sounds were driving him insane. Dr. Seuss told Dartmouth College, To keep from going nuts, I began reciting silly words to the rhythm of the engine. Out of nowhere, I found myself saying, And that is a story that no one can beat, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. I remember what a big day it was in my life when Mike McClintock called up and announced, I just sold a thousand copies of your book to Marshall Fields. Congratulations, you're an author. As the world edged towards World War II, Dr. Seuss put writing children's books on hold and committed himself to helping the war effort. He began to help create training and propaganda films for the United States Army. On January 7, 1943, Dr. Seuss became Captain Theodore Giesel. Dr. Seuss led Americans through the war. Using humor, Giesel influenced national security through characters like Private Snafu and through caricatured versions of the enemy. His cartoon posters and films convinced soldiers and civilians to follow security procedures to protect the nation. 
Following the war, America turned toward more domestic concerns, including the education of their children. When Life magazine published John Hersey's article, Why Students Bogged Down at the First Hour, which specifically mentioned Dr. Seuss as a valuable children's author, Giesel began to approach his children's books with greater purpose. William Spalding of Houghton Mifflin Publication gave Giesel a list of words and challenged him to write a book that first graders couldn't put down. Because he had such a limited amount of words and wanted to make them rhyme, he spent a year staring at the list until in frustration, he ran his eye down it just looking for something that rhymed. And it was cat, and it was hat. The Cat and the Hat was published on March 12, 1957. It was the first of its kind, made with 236 vocabulary words and a creative storyline. The Cat and the Hat was a breath of fresh air. The book sold out in Chicago in only 90 minutes. Dr. Seuss had become a celebrity. In each instance, Giesel, on alighting from his special chopper, had been surrounded by a sea of young fans. It was, he later told a reporter, as if I were Santa Claus. The success of The Cat and the Hat was quickly followed by Green Eggs and Ham, which used only 50 different words. Giesel knew that he had discovered a way to excite young readers and expanded by partnering with his wife, Helen Palmer, and editor Phyllis Cerf, to create beginner books in 1958 as a branch of Random House that specialized in only books for beginning readers. Under Giesel's leadership, a team of authors, including Stan and Jan Bernstein, Robert Lopshire, and P.D. Eastman, set about creating a series of books that have remained in print for more than 40 years. The editor, Theodore Giesel, had very specific ideas about what made a good children's book and fell back on his English professor's training to guide the authors. New authors and artists were surprised by Giesel's specific ideas on how to write an effective children's story. After their first meeting, Stan and Jan Bernstein were impressed by Giesel's passion towards revising and assisting them in making a higher quality book. The Bernsteins endured some of Giesel's critiques, including... Now let's talk about your rhymed verse. Your scansion is pretty good, but again, it's too complicated, and I've counted at least 10 convenience rhymes. I can't tell you how happy I am to be working with you. I just know we're going to get a wonderful book. When Seuss worked with any collaborators, he took second credit under the pseudonym Theo Lysik, but he never put the name Seuss on anything that wasn't entirely his. Easel took children seriously by recognizing their individuality. He personally answered a fan letter from Howard Cruz offering advice when asked. In 1957, he gave the advice, This is a field in which no one can give you pointers but yourself. To develop an individual style of writing and drawing, always go to yourself for criticism. If you ask advice from too many other people, then you are no longer yourself. Giesel quietly illustrated social values and the underlying themes of many of his books. This Nietzsche showed the foolishness of segregation, and Horton Hears a Who encouraged tolerance. Other books examined war or environmental awareness. The Cat in the Hat has become an icon. Since its publication in 1957, The Cat in the Hat has occupied children's bookshelves across the world. 200 million copies of The Cat in the Hat have been sold, with more to come. It's so um, capturing, the, the, the rhyming that he, that he puts together. It's, it's capturing and it just makes reading fun. The books have been translated into over 20 languages and enjoyed by four generations of readers, both young and old. A celebration for Dr. Seuss's birthday takes place every year in 40 cities across the country as a part of the National Education Association's Read Across America program. The celebrations include book readings, theatrical plays, costume character appearances, and interactive workshops. Fifty years after The Cat in the Hat was published, children still love Dr. Seuss and his books. Audrey Giesel summed up Seuss's impact on the world's hearts and souls with, I just know that the legacy he left is the fun of learning when you don't know you're learning. The child, Howard Cruz, whom Seuss advised in 1957, wrote again to Seuss in 1985, shortly before the publication of his first book, crediting Seuss with helping him become a better author and person. After four generations, Dr. Seuss's legacy and children's love for his books continue to grow. With a mere 236 vocabulary words, Theodore Seuss Giesel revolutionized the world of children's literature. His colorful illustrations and fast-paced rhymes set a new standard for children's authors. But above all, he taught children to love reading. Giesel summed up his own legacy in six short words to the children of Troy, Michigan.